Chapter 10 of The Life of Benjamin Franklin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Blanchard. The Life of Benjamin Franklin by Samuel G. Goodrich. Chapter 10. Anecdote William Penn, Education of Youth subscription for an academy franklin overloaded with public offices member of the assembly treaty with the indians at carlisle public hospital anecdote it was thought by some of the friends of franklin that he would offend the peace-loving sect of quakers by his activity in these warlike preparations a young man who had some friends in the assembly and wished to succeed him as their clerk told him in a quiet way that it was intended to displace him at the next election, and that, as a friend, he should advise him to resign. The answer which Franklin made to the obliging young man was in the following words. I have heard or read of some public man who made it a rule never to ask for an office, and never to refuse one when offered to him. I approve of this rule, and shall practice it with a small addition. I shall never ask, never refuse, nor ever resign an office. If they will have my office of clerk to dispose of it to another, they shall take it from me. I will not give it up. At the next election, Franklin was unanimously elected clerk. Notwithstanding the general sentiment of the Quakers, Franklin thought the military defence of the country not disagreeable to any of them. One of their number, the learned and honourable Mr. Logan, wrote an address to them, declaring his appropriation of defensive war and supporting his opinion by very strong arguments. This gentleman related an anecdote of his old master, William Penn, in respect to the subject of defence, which is quite amusing. He came over from England when a young man, as secretary to this distinguished Quaker. It was wartime, and their ship was chased by an armoured vessel, supposed to be an enemy. Their captain prepared for defence, but told William Penn and his company of Quakers that he did not expect their assistance, and they might retire into the cabin. They all retired except James Logan, who chose to stay upon deck and was quartered to a gun. The supposed enemy proved a friend, so there was no fighting. When the secretary went to carry the information to his friends in the cabin, William Penn spoke to him in a severe language for staying upon deck and undertaking to assist in the defence of the vessel, contrary to the principles of the friends. This reproof, being before all the company, vexed the secretary who replied, I being thy servant, why did thee not order me to come down? but thee was willing enough that I should stay and help to fight the ship, when thee thought there was danger. Peace being concluded, and the business of defence at an end, Franklin next turned his thoughts to the affairs of establishing an academy. The first step he took was to associate in the design a number of his active friends. The next was to write and publish a pamphlet entitled Proposals Relating to the Education of Youth in Philadelphia. This he distributed among the principal inhabitants, and in a short time opened a subscription for supporting an academy. The subscribers were desirous of carrying the plan into immediate execution. The constitutions for the government of the academy were soon drawn up and signed. A house was hired, masters engaged, and the school opened. This was the year 1749. The scholars increased rapidly. The house was soon found too small, when accident threw in their way a large house, ready built, which, with a few alterations, would exactly answer their purpose. This was a building erected by the hearers of Mr. Whitefield. Some difficulty had been found by the trustees in paying the expenses of this church, and they were prevailed upon to give it up for the academy. It was soon made fit for that purpose, and the scholars were removed into the building. The whole care and trouble of superintending this work fell upon Franklin, who found sufficient leisure to attend to it, from having taken a very able and industrious partner in his printing business. Franklin now thought that he should find leisure, during the rest of his life, to pursue his philosophical studies and amusements. He purchased all the instruments and apparatus of Dr. Spence, who had come from England to lecture on philosophy in Philadelphia. His intention was to proceed with diligence in his experiments in electricity, but the public now considered him a man of leisure, and laid hold of him for their purposes. 
he seems to have been quite overloaded with officers. The governor made him a justice of the peace. The city corporation chose him a member of the common council, and shortly after, alderman. The citizens elected him to represent them in the assembly, of which he had so long been clerk. All these offices were signs of the esteem and respect in which he was held among his fellow citizens. Franklin tried the office of Justice of the Peace a little while, by attending a few courts, and sitting on the bench to hear causes, finding, however, that it required more knowledge of the law than he possessed. He gradually withdrew from it, excusing himself by being obliged to attend his duties as member of the assembly. To this office he was chosen for ten years in succession, without ever asking any elector for his vote, or signifying, directly or indirectly, any desire of the honour. On taking his seat in the house, his son was appointed their clerk. During the next year, a treaty was to be held with the Indians at Carlisle. The governor sent a message to the house, requesting that they should nominate some of their members to be joined with some members of council for that purpose. The house named the speaker Mr. Norris and Dr. Franklin, and being commissioned, they went to Carlisle to treat with the Indians. As the Indians were apt to drinking to excess, and when drunk were very quarrelsome and disorderly, the commissioners strictly forbade the sale of any liquor to them. When they complained of this, they were told that on condition of their remaining perfectly sober during the treaty, they should have plenty of rum when the business was over. They accordingly promised this, and kept their promise for the very best reason in the world, because they were unable to break it. The treaty was conducted with perfect order, and concluded to the satisfaction of both parties. They then claimed and received rum. This was in the afternoon. The Indians were about one hundred in number, men, women, and children, and were lodged in cabins, built in the form of a square, just without the town. In the evening there was a great noise among them, and the commissioners walked out to see what was the matter. They found a great bonfire built in the middle of the square, and the men and women in a state of intoxication, fighting and quarrelling around it. The tumult could not be stilled, and the commissioners retired to their lodgings. At midnight a number of the Indians came thundering at their door, demanding more rum, but the commissioners took no notice of them. The next day they were sensible of their misbehaviour, and sent three of their old counsellors to make an excuse. The orator acknowledged the fault, but laid it upon the rum, and then endeavoured to excuse the rum, by saying, the great spirit, who made all things, made everything for some use, and whatever use he designed anything for, that use it should always be put to. Now when he made rum, he said, let this be for the Indians to get drunk with, and it must be so. It is a sad truth that among all savage nations, the introduction of spirituous liquor has been the most severe curse that ever fell upon them. In 1751, Dr. Thomas Bond formed a plan to establish a hospital in Philadelphia for the reception and cure of poor sick persons, whether inhabitants of the province or strangers. He was very active in the endeavour to procure subscriptions for it, but the proposal being new in America, and at the first not well understood, he met with but little success. At length he came to Franklin with the compliment that there was no such thing as carrying a public-spirited thing through without his being concerned in it. For, said he, I am often asked by those to whom I promise subscription, have you consulted Franklin on this business? And what does he think of it? And when I tell them I have not, they do not subscribe, but say they will consider it. Franklin inquired into the nature of the probable usefulness of the scheme, and being satisfied in respect to it, not only subscribed himself, but was active in procuring subscriptions from others. Some aid was obtained from the assembly of the province, a convenient and handsome building was soon erected. The institution was found useful, and flourished to the present day. It was about the same time that another project, the Reverend Gilbert Tennant, came to Franklin with the request that he would assist him in procuring subscriptions to erect a new meeting house. It was to be devoted to the use of a congregation he had gathered among the original disciples of Mr. Whitefield. Franklin was too wise to make himself disagreeable to his fellow citizens by such frequent calls upon their generosity, and absolutely refused. The gentleman then desired he would furnish him with a list of the names of persons he knew by experience to be generous and public-spirited. This also was refused, for it was hard that their kind compliance with a request of charity should mark them out 
to be worried by all who chose to call upon them. Franklin was then asked to give his advice. That I will do, he replied. And in the first place, I advise you to apply to all those who you know will give something. Next, to those whom you are uncertain whether they will give anything or not, and show them the list of those who have given. And lastly, do not neglect those who you are sure will give nothing, for in some of them you may be mistaken. The clergyman laughed and promised to take his advice. He did so, for he asked of everybody and soon obtained money enough to erect a spacious and elegant meeting house. Franklin now exerted himself in several matters that, however small they may seem, affected the convenience and comfort of his fellow citizens in a great degree. This was in respect to cleaning, paving, and lighting the streets. By talking and writing in the papers, he was able to introduce great changes in these matters, which were very important to the cleanliness and good appearance of the text missing in printed book. End chapter 10.